We wanted to play the most American song we could pay for. I think Josh is going to play that for us. Uh, and if you know the words, sing along. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and crackers. I don't care if I never get back for its root. Root, root for Dodgers, copy to whoever you want. Don't win, it's a shame. Or it's one, two, three strikes, you're out at the old ball. Game! Play ball, everybody! You hear that sound? That's the sound of patriotism. Specifically, my own patriotism. I have a terrible voice. I agree. But here's what's more important. It's where I'm singing. And it's Tijuana, Mexico, to a bunch of deported f***ing vets. Did you know we deport vets? I didn't know that either. But apparently we do. If they aren't born here, and they didn't go through the process of becoming a citizen, even though they're guaranteed that citizenship because they've decided to fight for this country. If they commit a crime, we can kick them out of this country. And then we won't let them back in. I think that sucks. And that's why we went to Tijuana, Mexico, to talk to those guys who just want to be back in America. And so that stood out as we traveled down to Tijuana. This doesn't exactly seem like a partisan issue. Whether you're on the left or the right, if people decide to put their life on the line to fight for this country, most people agree those people should live in this country if they want to. So what's the f***ing problem then? That's what we tried to figure out. A few weeks ago, we talked to Sebastian Younger, author of Tribe. We asked him to come back and tell us what he thinks about deported f***ing vets. But first, more on this story that had us crossing the border to find America's veterans. This is Klepper. Veterans. They get priority boarding, inspire mattress sales, and even get an annual chance to guess and win a Ford Fiesta. When it comes to how our country talks about our troops, right, left, up, down, all say the same damn thing. Thank you to veterans. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your extraordinary service. They're thanking me for the service. Well, almost the same thing. That's why I was so surprised to find out that some of the formerly deployed are currently getting deported. We're deporting American veterans. Deported U.S. vets. Deported vets. Deported vets. Today we talk about deported f***ing vets. And the we in this situation is AP on Clepper Show. Melissa Hirsch, how are you? Good, how are you? Doing good. <laughs> and field producer Todd Bieber. Todd, how are you, sir? I'm great. Deported f***ing vets. I will tell you what immediately jumps to mind and why we say deported f***ing vets. Um... One of the writers on our show, Russ Armstrong, found the story about these vets who had been deported from America. Um, they fought for America. They were deported because of a crime they committed, and they hadn't gotten their citizenship. And because of that, uh, after they served their time, they were deported. And some were living in Tijuana, and they were unable to get back. He pitched that story, and we had a log line of, like, why does this story matter? And all he wrote was, deported f***ing vets. <laughs> yeah. And I think that kept... <laughs> kept ringing in my ears throughout this. It's like, oh, there's many nuances in this story, and it does get complicated, but at the end, we're deporting f***ing vets. Yeah, when I like when talking to other people about the episodes that we're doing, mm -hmm. that's the one where like you just say, oh, we did an episode on deported vets, and like everybody's like, what? <laughs> like you can say like, oh, well, there's a uh, there's kids in uh, underground university, and like, oh, explain that to me. I don't really understand it, but immediately people are like, vets are getting deported. <laughs> it's it's pretty crazy when yeah. you hear about it. I think this story is kind of interesting in how you're approaching it from the beginning because it's this intersection of immigration, veterans issues, dealing with trauma, like just all these things kind of coming together. The reason that these veterans are getting deported is because of this entire change in our legal immigration system, you know, in 1996, where because of that, it vastly expanded the number of crimes that would be considered deportable offenses. Things like check fraud and mail fraud, you know, of course, there were like kind of, you know, more intense things as well. But you can see that, you know, there are like 30, over 30 crimes that people can be deported for now. And so you kind of stumble upon essentially what is very much of a broken system where, you know, we're looking for a lot more reasons to deport people now than we were before. I think that, that was some of the interesting conversations we started to have. And also with some of the critics, there were rules that were broken. It, 
again, time was served, I think, for if you were an American citizen, you committed a crime, you went to jail, you came out, we believe in second chances, we believe in no double jeopardy, and then you get to go back into society. What has been set up is this, these guys, the ability to live in this country they fought for has now been removed which I think the large question we kept coming back to was this idea of like, what does it mean to be an American? Is it what you do for America or, or whether you're from America? We kept posing this as we would go out. And I think like immigration is such a sticky issue and it's so easy to see people as other, but a choice to actually serve for the, the country that you, you live in seemed to hold such weight with most of the people we talked to. I think that was really a resonant thing that we found on the road. The bullet point version of why these guys got deported it was like they came here often as young kids under like usually with their parents like under six 18 they wanted to become legitimate citizens the u.s promises them citizenship if you serve for the country so they're like i'm gonna do that so they serve for the country always in conflict so afghanistan iraq vietnam uh they would go, they would fight, they would come back. Oftentimes, the guys that we talked to, most of them suffered from some sort of PTSD. It leads to a higher uh, likelihood that they're going to commit some sort of crime, which is across the board for all veterans, not just immigrant veterans. Uh, these guys committed some sort of felony, which could be DUI. One guy was forged to check so that his family could get uh, welfare. They served time. Oftentimes, like it could be like a few months to a couple years. ICE or Homeland Security was waiting at the door for them when they got out, whereas most people would get out, rehabilitate back into society. These guys, then there'd be a car or a truck waiting for them. They would take them to the border uh, and they'd be dumped off. They put me in jail, uh, supposedly with assault. So I spent 494 days in jail. There was no trial or nothing. There was a free man. My family was outside waiting for me. And I never got to see them. After fighting to secure the homeland, Joe was deported by Homeland Security. Luckily, he was the ideal age to start over, 73. So evidently vet plus immigrant plus criminal equals not American. The thing that I think uh, was in Russ's original pitch was this um, Manuel, this guy Manuel, who was under threat of being deported himself, um, was able to fight that off and then decided to take it in his own hands to go across the country and let politicians know that this was happening. Because what we found is like some politicians don't even know this is happening. And he was a character. <laughs> uh, I remember we were in a meeting. Yeah. And you're like, oh, great. We found our expert. And – I think we both looked at each other and we're like, well, expert might not be the <laughs> the word. He's passionate. I think I was the first one who contacted him. And I just remember like getting off the phone with him and Stu, the executive producer, being like hovering over me, essentially just waiting for me to make this call. Initially, you know, having to explain this is for a comedy show. This is for a show with Jordan Klepper. Of course, he didn't know who you were. You not know? of course. <laughs> I wouldn't say of course. I would say that is also a fact. But sure, not, not sure. the assumption is he wouldn't know. Honestly, me. it's either like, of course, they don't know who you are. And if they do know who you are, they're like, no, they hang up. I'm like, yeah, I don't yeah, want to yeah. be interviewed. But I don't want to be made fun of by Jordan Clapper. That's yeah. not what I do. Yeah. I, I, know it's I, what do. I listen. I respond. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot of our job as APs is really having a lot of spiels ready for either one of those conversations, basically. <laughs> spiels. But, <you're> <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, it's going to be great. It's a docu-series now. It's not The Daily Show. But, you know, like in this case, it was very much the first boat where he just had no idea and kind of walking through, well, it's going to be a show he wants to tag along with you. And he kind of walked us through this whole tour that he's going to be doing. This is Manuel Valenzuela, a 66-year-old Vietnam vet with a mission to bring the deported vets back home. After narrowly escaping a deportation order himself, Manuel bought an RV, wrapped it with his face, and set out on a mission, road tripping from state capital to state capital, raising awareness about deported vets and getting two miles per gallon. I'm a Marine. I don't leave nobody behind. As a Marine, you should be saying, how can I help? I'm standing up. This is wrong. I've gone to senators, I've gone to congressmen, I've gone all over. I gotta find a way. With the help of his trusty banner, Manuel has shoved his message in the face of former presidents, former almost presidents, and practically every person he ever encounters. We bring each other home. We're on our way to the Arizona State Capitol on an unyielding mission that cannot be stopped. Except for potty breaks. What do you think about veterans being deported? 
It's a shame. My grandfather's a Korean War veteran, earned his citizenship. Can you imagine what he, and it's, you know, he's in the grave right now. Oh, is he yeah. here? No, he's not here. I'm going to get a petition from all the deported veterans saying, honor our veterans by bringing them all back home. He may only be one man, but he's a man willing to hug complete strangers at gas stations. <laughs> it's an honor. Thank you. The honor is all mine. What is compelling is people who see themselves as activists and they take action. They get in a car, they go somewhere. They drop a flag, they protest, they do direct actions. And Manuel was a guy like, he bought a fucking RV. <laughs> he put his face on it and he drove wherever he could to try to get attention. He would go to political rallies, he would talk to President Obama, whatever he could. He'd say, like, nobody's paying attention to uh, deported vets. And he was absolutely imperfect in his way of doing it. But, like, I'd rather have someone imperfect actually doing it than what of 99.99% of the rest of us are doing, which is nothing. Well, yeah. And I would argue, too, like, imperfect, I, I, I don't want to, it sounds like a pejorative. I think what we started to discover with this series is, like, I, I don't know what perfect protest looks like. But Manuel's mission to raise awareness faces many obstacles, everything from a complacent public to his own blood alcohol content. We cannot just give up. We got to keep going. As a result of past DUI convictions, Manuel has to blow a breathalyzer periodically to keep driving. How often do you have to do that? It's just random. You know, right there where I got that, uh, majority of the veterans. Yeah. We come back from wars, we got problems. And then a lot of them use drugs, alcohol to cope with it, and we get in trouble, and this happens. Did you go through those problems coming back? Oh. Was it tough to adjust? When I got back from Nama, I was I'm lucky I'm still alive. You feel out of place. Yeah. Mentally, you're brainwashed to kill. And then when you come back, you got all this training, you don't know what to do with it in society. In my case, Vietnam veterans, we didn't have nobody for us. Thank you for your service, say yeah. That's him. Manuel was, uh, you know, didn't have an infrastructure, like had a plan that kept changing here and there. I think <laughs> as a production team, sometimes that's hard. I think we were trying to figure out how to follow this tour that he was on, but the tour in and of itself was nebulous at times. But what we knew was like he was a guy who cared. And that to me was like the most compelling element of like, that's the American spirit. Somebody who wants to do something, even if they don't exactly know how to achieve it, they're freaking doing something. Can I say that your tone is much different now than when you were in the van with him for <laughs> three hours with no air conditioning? There was no fucking air conditioning. That is true. This is... <laughs> you're like, what is perfect? There is no such thing as perfect. At the time, you're like, where's the plan? Why isn't there AC in this thing? We had to pull over at one point because Manuel was like, I, I have to fix this for Jordan. And uh, we were already like a day behind schedule. And, uh, and then I was like, if we can do it really quickly one morning. And so he pulls in. He's like, it's going to be real quick. It'll just be over half the day. And um, <laughs> we were in a garage for a good four hours before I was like, Jordan, can we please continue with this journey to save deported vets without air conditioning. You're, now you're making me the bad guy in this. <laughs> right? That's That was a character choice to be, <laughs> to be somebody who is mildly perturbed driving through the Southwest entire days in a van with no air conditioning. That to me did seem insane. Yeah. I was a little, I was a little <laughs> I'll admit that was not my finest moment. I was excited about a road trip. I was like, this is a road trip, the show, this is, this is the American spirit. We're out, we're doing something, road trip, Great, let's get in this RV. Yes, Manuel, you are the best. Let's go. Where's the Where's the AC? There's no AC. It's 95 degrees. We're driving through Arizona. No AC. I mean, that's insane. Let's be honest. We can. We want to change the world, but first, let's do it in comfort. Yeah, I was in the follow car, so it did not bother me <laughs> at all. I didn't mind. I just remember, like, from our angle back in the office, we had prepared like all of the sites along the way, along the route that you guys were going to be on, like, and we'd been really ambitious and planning like bars and like, you know, like the big belt buckle that maybe you'd get to go to with Manuel and do all these things. And of course, like we get this message from Todd, I think on that day with the AC and there's just like, obviously none of this stuff has happened. You know, it's like what we realized is that we planned all this stuff and it's out the window, you know? But you also do start to stumble on places as well. Like for all of those failures, we found ourselves one night after a long night of driving in Scottsdale, Arizona, which is like an alien town. It's, it's oddly suburban. 
Uh, we arrive at this bar where we hear there's going to be dancing and when Manuel likes dancing so we we're going to go dancing with Manuel it, it turns out it was just like uh, it was a guy doing covers and there was um, do you remember this there was everybody was wearing bandanas because there was a drinking tour that was happening on like a Tuesday a scavenger night. hunt a scavenger hunt <laughs> it was a scavenger hunt in, in these bars so we go they were like what is this place it, it felt so alien the, the, what they had to do at the bar that we were at was sing a karaoke song they sang no diggity but a country version that was what they had to do and we were in the middle of it we were smack dab in the middle but what ends up happening is we walk into this bar and the guy behind the bar is literally wearing a maga hat as somebody who's been to a bunch of trump rallies i haven't had the best interactions with those folks we're walking in here and we're talking about immigration issues essentially and with everything that's on the front page at the time i was a little bit nervous about like oh we're gonna walk in here we might try to talk to people about what do they think about people who were not born in america wanting to come back to america maga hat guy's there we walk up to the bar and immediately he's like deported vets that's bullshit. I don't care where you're from. I don't care. If you fight for this country, you get to be in this country. And immediately, all those expectations you had of MAGA hat guy, gone. If you come to the United States and serve the f***ing country for two years, you should be, that should be so banned. Cool. It's yeah. done. It's done. That should have not happened to you. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Thank you for your service again. And then we look at the guitar player who's helping with all of this karaoke. He's, he's got an Afghanistan hat on, and we pull him out outside. He's conservative. He's been playing in this bar forever. He knows about this story. He knows about deported vets. He doesn't think it's a political issue. He thinks it's an issue people should care about. So I play here at the Spur twice a week. Now let me guess, you were in Afghanistan. Yeah, I was in Afghanistan, Kandahar City. Mind you, I'm a Southern Republican, but if you put the same boots on as me, I don't give a shit where you come from. You my brother, you should have the pathway to citizenship. So it don't matter if he only speaks Spanish because he's from Mexico and I only speak English because I'm from South Louisiana. And to be fair, they barely speak English in South Louisiana. Yeah, yeah, we hardly speak any English. We've stumbled on the America that we were looking for. We just didn't know we were gonna find it here in Scottsdale. Immigration was not what made them upset. What made them upset was two camera crews coming in on their drinking night. <laughs> and uh, turned out they did not want to confront you or Manuel, but they did want to confront me. And an older gentleman confronted me and uh, tried to beat me up that night. I don't, I mean. I do, I, I mildly remember that. I, he laid hands on me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm not a fighter. Uh, or a lover. Uh, or a lover, for that matter. That's, that's honestly, uh, uh, do you remember what he told me? He's like, he's like, this is my favorite bar. He's so drunk. This is my favorite bar. I've been coming here for years. You, you know why this is my favorite bar? Two years ago, I was sitting in this bar, and a horse walked in this bar. <laughs> and he goes, and you know what? If you want for your TV show a horse to come in this bar, I can make it happen. <laughs> and I am just trying to make him happy at this point so he doesn't beat up me. And I said, I, I would love to see a horse walk in this bar. And he got really flustered because <laughs> he knew that like he like might have to deliver. He's like, like uh, give me two days. <laughs> give me two days and I can get a horse in here. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> this show was going to thrive when we could find people who cared so much that we could zoom in on some person's desire to make a change uh, and then focus on the larger issues, immigration, the way we treat uh, veterans. These are big issues. They're things we're talking about day in and day out. Um, prison reform, like what happens when somebody serves their time? Like, do we, do we give them second chances? Do we kick them out of this country? Those are big topics. I think what we found is like the best way for us to tell those stories is to see the people who are attempting to affect that narrative and like see if we can be along for the ride just to see how hard that is. I think in this particular case, too, what we saw was Manuel did go to the politicians to drag, try and get his message out, and he failed. Like, they weren't, it fell on deaf ears, but what he was able to do with this road trip, which is surprising, was go to the bars, go to the gas stations, go to the biggest belt buckles, and he brought up pictures of the deported vets and uh, at every single stop, and he made his point one by one, and it was inspiring. And I think it, it, it did, like, kind of tell us a little bit about what the show is going to be about, which was it's the one-on-one -on -one, uh, interactions more than it is like going to a group of politicians who may not pay attention. They're building so many monuments of us fighting. If that's not helping us, put us here and then forget the ones that are living. And then now it's worse. 
we're getting deported. It's a disgrace and dishonor to us, brothers. And let's talk about the flip side as well. So we traveled with Manuel, but where we ended up was Tijuana uh, at this place called The Bunker. Do you remember researching The Bunker or, or figuring out what The Bunker in Tijuana actually was? Yeah, I remember there is this uh, bunker in Tijuana and that there's this guy, um, Hector Barajas, who is running it and actually who is one of the few people who's actually been able to regain, uh, you know, legal residency in the U.S. like just last year, actually. And so, you know, to reach out to him and like to be able to talk with him and, you know, what he was able to really share was, you know, exactly what the reality is of life in this bunker, you know, and even when we were asking like, you know, what is it that we can even bring? What can we do? We were trying to figure out what the story was along the way. And just even hearing simple things like, you know, we need cleaning supplies because people live here or hearing, you know, like just some of the things that we were asking about and like, you know, just sharing some of the like the realities of it, that these people were working in these call centers and everything, you know, like talking to Americans on the other side, you know. So that was something that I think was just in itself was just so compelling. So this is the kitchen area. These are the living quarters. This is where we house, we do have military cots. This is actually the bunker's mascot, Boots. Hey, Boots. Jack, another deported vet, runs the place. He's like a concierge, but instead of recommending restaurants, he suggests asylum lawyers. How many people have come through here? I'd say close to about 100 vets. 100 vets? Yeah, at least through this bunker here. Mm -hmm. Fun fact, you may have recently spoken to these guys. Most of the vets work in a call center where they do tech support for iPads or help Americans book vacations. That's right, deported vets help tourists find flights to a country they can never enter, which really rubs salt in the exile. After serving time for crimes like drug possession, carrying an unlicensed firearm and check fraud, the vets were deported. Now they're in a Tijuana bunker with more patriotic tchotchkes than a TGI Fridays. They're homesick. I think you hear deported vets, but then you don't think about what's the next step. Mm -hmm. Like, these guys are getting dropped off at the Tijuana border with no uh, cell phone, no wallet, no identification. And it turns out a group of Marines, Hector Bras, has created what is started off as a the back of his car where he would drive around with supplies for these guys that were often homeless and has now turned into an actual halfway house where they have two stories. It is not glamorous by any means. Uh, As you know, we were there, but like it it is, it is a small, tiny little, like almost like frat house uh, covered in GI Joe's American flags. It was the most patriotic place I've ever been. Mm -hmm. And it was in Tijuana. Mm -hmm. I think that was, it was pretty powerful to walk into uh, the bunker, and we're confronted with these somewhere close to a, a dozen men who have been kicked out of this country, separated from their families, uh, and before we even sat down to kind of start an interview, we immediately start talking. They have stories to tell. They're passionate. They're frustrated. They're angry. They're they're joking. There's there's. There's so much life in that room, uh, but there's also so much struggle to get back to this country that they love so dearly. What do you guys miss most about America? Everything. All my family's over there, so my mother, my sisters, my brothers. I miss out and see my oldest son get married. I have grandchildren I haven't even met. There's nowhere's home for me here. I eat burritos too, don't get me wrong, and I love beans and rice, I do, I really do. But my identity is American. And uh, man, I love I love the the, the crumb, crumb cakes that they sell with the with the carton milk. You miss the crumb cakes. Yeah, and I definitely. It feels like you're not missing the crumb cakes too much. <laughs> when we were down there, I know we were talking about what what is a way that we can find a little taste of optimism there, and not just be flies on a wall. We knew there wasn't a ton we could do, but we wanted to do something, so we decided to throw a party, which was it ended up being a really joyous event, I think. And we couldn't go back across the border. We didn't have time, so we had to throw the most American party possible in Tijuana, which meant we went to a market that was filled with piñatas. We got a number one piñata that was red, white, and blue that was meant for a one-year-old's birthday. (laughs) But Americans see themselves as number one, so it totally works. We got a Captain America. It also fits our mentality, though. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. And we actually, what was a nice moment of kismet, because we had that connection with Josh in Scottsdale, the musician, we called him up, 
And we're like, hey, we are doing this thing. Can we fly you to Tijuana and get you to come and perform for these vets? Which was actually a wonderful moment. He played for the vets. He sat down. He talked to them about his experience uh, overseas. They talked with him. Uh, like getting to watch those 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 guys connect. Many of them from totally different generations um, was was wonderful to see. Uh, had some sweet barbecue. People brought their families who were in Tijuana, and uh, and then we played a bunch of royalty free music, <laughs> just in case we needed to use it for the show. Which, in retrospect, I regret. Uh, it's not the most fun to dance to. Can I tell a funny story? <laughs> no, a funny funny story. Is, I don't know if this is the place. <laughs> okay. Because uh, we went to Tijuana. Mm-hmm. This is, uh, the f- I think, the first time you and I, um, for for a project, went across the border. Um, I think so. Uh, and we get to the border, and there is a long line. You're you're at the Mexican uh, American border. Uh, you see a sign that says Mexico. There's long lines. It goes through these, like uh, from like eight cars down to two cars down to one car, and then you get in these little lanes, and then someone stops you at a checkpoint, and you stop and. Uh, of course, we're a white van filled with a bunch of people with hard black cases filled with who knows what. So we get ushered aside. And Those said, cases were cameras, just FYI. Yes. yes. <laughs> Somebody yeah. does know what. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we knew what. Yes, we know what. <laughs> they don't know what. They didn't know what. Yeah. So we get to this part, and we're, we're, we're ushered aside, and they start opening the cases, and they're like, camera crew, uh, you uh, like uh, what's going on are you guys filming something you should have paperwork for that it was a brand new show this was a very first shoot so we didn't even have business cards no one knew what Klepper was you couldn't not uh, no one I just <laughs> yeah all the border security that were reading Deadline knew who it was <laughs> but other than that so what we had to do because we didn't have any way of proving that we were a legitimate Comedy Central crew we had to bring up, we Google image searched and showed them a picture of Jordan interviewing Vicente Fox, the former president of Mexico, so that we could prove that we were a legitimate production company. So they're like looking at my phone, looking in the backseat of Jordan, like, okay, yeah, you're a legitimate person. It checked out. It checked out. And they let us go through. So this is, if we do it right, I interview a president from every country around the world that eventually I can travel without passports and what have you. I can go anywhere and just bring my phone. Yeah, Mm -hmm. there you go. Takeaways, what still resonates with you? I mean, obviously, when we met with Joe, one of the deported vets who was 74 years old at the border, um, that was pretty powerful. I think not just interviewing Joe at the wall that exists in Tijuana, because there is a wall that exists and has existed for a long time in certain key areas. And there's a place called Friendship Park. At Friendship Park is a place where they open up the two different fences and allow people from the American side to meet with the people from the Mexican side through a a very small, like, opening. It's, like, basically the size of a dime, like, uh, is, is the space. And so we went there one day and filmed, and you could see a father on one side and a, a wife and his son on the other side. And the son... Uh, at one point put his little finger through and the father just grabbed that finger and wept and you could hear weeping from three people on both sides and when you're down there filming a comedy thing and you're like thinking about what jokes did we land and what didn't land and then you see this family here you're like this is wrong like the way we are conducting and treating fellow humans is 100% uh, evil uh, in in so many ways and uh, I will uh, never uh, not have that image in my brain when people talk about build a wall. When you say chant, uh, build a wall, I see a little kid's finger coming through the the hole in the wall. Bit of a downer, Todd. Wow. Well, it's good we're on uh, HBO. <laughs> <laughs> where are we now? So right now, I mean, we're pretty much where we were last year and the year before that. Um, I think the one thing that um, is interesting is that, you know, we have people who are at least somewhat in power who are advocating for this. Um, you know, actually, there was a bill in the House, several bills in the House that came up in February um, related to this um, that were actually, I think, just 
similar bills to what has been like advocated for in the past. And then we had a bill that came up in the Senate. Um, and so we're getting some moves right now where they're actually advocating for this. There are people who are really who care about this. Um, but I think it's just inevitably these things have just been stalling in the past few years, you know. So it's not like there aren't people who are trying to do something. And I'll say yeah. we were scrolling through my Twitter feed recently and up pops a video Elizabeth Warren posted. And in that video... A citizen stood up and told her about deported vets and how important it is to not forget them and not leave a man behind and asked Elizabeth Warren if she became president, would she right these wrongs? And she said, yes. And of course, that person was Manuel. It was fun to see that he's still out there. He's still showing up and he's still bringing this issue to people if they refuse to go to it. And it's a five-minute video because it he really expresses <laughs> he takes in a time. very <laughs> grandpa way <laughs> how important this issue, this issue is. Yeah, but grandpa's putting in work. He does. He is. Credit, he is. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a few weeks ago, we had author, journalist, Academy Award nominee, Sebastian Younger on to talk about veterans issues. We wanted to bring him back to talk about these deported vets. Sebastian Younger, thank you for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. And so I see your book. I see Tribe. I know Sebastian Younger. I know the, the films you've been a part of. I know the books you've written. I'm like, great, let's take a look at this. Um, and I will say, I picked this thing up. And I think, where is it? It's like page two. You write, how do you become an adult in a society that doesn't ask for sacrifice? How do you become a man in the world that doesn't require courage? That's big. I think those are two huge questions. What I was drawn by, I started framing this idea of partisanship in the world, words of like what teams we choose, and immediately you're talking about it in what we need. Is, is, that how you, is that how you see it? When we're talking about tribes, what are we essentially talking about? Well, okay, so here's the thing. You can have a genetic or a cultural predisposition. You know, a, a lot of your political opinion is cultural too or, or environmental. You could have those convictions and still deal uh, in a dignified, respectful way with your adversaries, right? And we, we know from marriage. Can you? Can, yeah, you oh, can. Mar okay, mar we know from marriage, okay, right? I mean, oh. married couples can have horrific fights about things, huge differences of opinion, but they never get to the point where this, well, some do, and then they get divorced. But, but stable marriages, even with, that have a lot of conflict in them, as long as, I mean, psychologists will tell you, as long as in the conflict that the married couple is talking to each other with a minimum level of respect, without that they're, they're not um, that they're not using contempt with each other, uh, that the marriage is going to be okay. As soon as contempt creeps in, um, it's one of the statistical indicators of divorce. When people talk to each other with contempt, which is very different from just a disagreement, like even a violent disagreement, right? So the trick in a country is you're going to have these arguments. We should have arguments. Good solutions come out of arguments. Right? If just the left wing or just the right wing rang the country, it would be a disaster either way. Right? What works is we, we get this sort of middle ground where nobody's ent entirely happy, but everyone gets a little bit of what they want. That keeps society, and I think ha always has for hundreds of thousands of years, keeps society on a kind of healthy middle path. But that doesn't work if politicians, political leaders, crank up the contemptuous rhetoric and start to actually demonize the opposing side, start to turn them into an enemy of the, the very country that we're supposedly all part of. And when, when politicians do that, they really are sowing the seeds of a kind of self-destruction. I mean, Al-Qaeda is not going to take this country down. The only country powerful enough in the world to take down America is America. And if it happens, it's going to be with words. It won't be with bullets. It'll be, be with words. And I think you can see the beginnings of that process. We're going to stop. I think we're going to end it. But I think the beginnings of that process, I think you have seen in the last few years. Now, uh, this idea of service being uh, ideally an American, uh, an American trait or something that can help the, say, American brand, if you will, a story that we're following is the story of deported veterans, who were veterans who served, um, deported because of uh, a felony conviction, and then because they hadn't gotten their um, citizenship, they were kicked out of this country. Uh, we went down to the bunker where a lot of uh, the veterans are in Tijuana who are just dying to get back there. And I think the larger question that this brought up with a lot of the people we talked to is as far as this American identity goes, is it more important what you do for America or more important that you're from America? Uh, I mean, 
you can be from America and not do much for America. And I think that describes most people, yeah. unfortunately. <laughs> you know, And I think we're really being deprived of something as, as a people to not be given the opportunity to serve the country. And um, I mean, I, you know, there are countries with mandatory national service. And I th- I'm not talking about the draft. The problem with the draft is you only need it during wartime. Well, how do you serve your country without a rifle? You know, what about with a book or with a shovel or whatever? And and uh, so one idea that people have had that I, I am very supportive of is a mandatory is mandatory national service. And the advantage of it, I mean, psychologists will tell you that the more you sacrifice for something, the more you value it. I think one of the problems of this country right now is that we don't ask for any sacrifice from anybody. You don't have to do anything to belong to this place, right? So the, we hold it in quite low value. And as soon as you put in a couple of years of your life, year of your life when you're a young person working for this country, the value increases. Um, I, um, I, I spent a lot of time in Eastern Europe, and teenagers would go to work camps, right, in the, in the summer. They'd build railroad track, they'd, har- they'd harvest wheat, they'd whatever, right? They had a great time, right? They were without their parents, they lived in barracks, they had a great time. And it really, and this is, these are communist bloc countries, right? It was like Bulgaria, right? Very poor countries. They said, what that did to their sense of community was unbelievable. It was the best time in their life, right? We've been deprived of that. And I think some program of national service would, would make us value what we have, which is a tremendous, amazing country, but also it would mix everybody up, right? Rich, poor, black, white, religious, non-religious, like Republican, Democrat, Everybody, you'd all be sleeping in the same barracks, <laughs> right? It would be awesome for people. I love this. What I want to say, I want you to go pitch an 18-year-old influencer on a year of service. Oh, you don't have to convince that person. <laughs> you, just, you just have to pass the legislation. That's, that's how you convince them. Yeah. You make it illegal yeah. for them not yeah, to I do it. Yeah, I not give a tax incentive to do it or whatever. I mean, I mean, there's ways to, there's ways to do it, right? Yeah. I mean, if you can draft people, you can get them to like help build schools in the inner city. I mean, whatever. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, if we can't even muster that out of our youth, then the country's doomed. You're talking a lot about the rhetoric and what, what kind of toxic environment that creates here. And you, you speak a little bit about this in the book. Um, I want to talk about uh, veterans who serve. It feels like supporting vets is a pretty universal thing in this country. At least people will say that. They get behind the idea of we should support the vets. Immigration is a hot button issue and divides people. When we talk about deported vets, on a political scale, the immigration wins out. and They're more immigrants than they are veterans at that point. Why do you think that is? I mean, I think partly because the uh, president has made immigration the foremost issue of his campaign and his presidency, and he has not made veterans' issues that important. So I think if, the, if President Trump had campaigned on veterans' issues, it might be different. It might be turned around, but he didn't, right? Immigration is it, and I mean, he's doing absolutely everything he can to promote a, an immigration an immigration agenda and and nobody's talking about veterans if he were I think we might be more upset about it I you know, just yesterday I was at a, at Virginia, Virginia Tech and a, and a cadet came up to me young Latino man he came up to me and, and he said he said my parents were illegal immigrants and I remember when I was a kid my dad built the dorm that I'm living in now amazing and now he's living in it, and he's an American citizen, and he's going to serve this country. Mm-hmm. You know, so something like, I'm going by memory, but I think something like 8% of the U.S. military was born in another country, not American citizen. So, you know, I think um, on some level, if we don't integrate these two competing things, um, we are just going to become a kind of politically schizophrenic country that can't function. I mean, it's a matter of us being able to function, and we can't. And... Uh, they will pay the price immediately, but in the long term, the U.S. will pay the price if we can't have those two conversations at the same time. So we have to hold two ideas in our head at once. That's a lot to ask of most Americans. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> you bring up this idea of uh, we, 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 are, we are not only partisan right now, but we, we feel like we're losing some of our identity based on not being able to serve, let's say. Uh, as the, rhetoric, as the rhetoric ramps up and as it feels like our connection to our own communities right. is, is fracturing more and more, like, do you look upon that uh, with a sense of optimism? I, listen, I think, I think we're headed towards a crisis, and I think some very good healthy changes will come out of the crisis. I mean, on, honestly. I mean, I see 
the effect of social media on young people. I see the the addiction rate, the suicide rate. I mean, all of these things, the political rhetoric. I mean, all the indicators are going the wrong direction, which sounds like terrible news. It sounds like I'm a pessimist, right? Except that humans are survivors. And culturally, politically, we're in just this, in this big oscillation, right? And so right now, we're oscillating in one direction, and it's going to hit a crisis, and we're going to react and go back in the other direction. I mean, you know, we've had, what, 40, 50 years of sort of like liberal humanitarianism. That happens to be where I'm at politically, right, is that sort of mindset. We've had 50 years of it, right? It worked well in some senses and worked very badly in other senses. And the pendulum swung back again. It has the right to do that, mm -hmm. right? But I think we can be quite confident that once it hits a sort of crisis level on the other side, it's going to produce these sort of reaction behaviors that will send it back into what I think for a lot of people will be comfortable territory. There's a lot of crises out there waiting to happen. There's an environmental crisis, a political crisis, economic crisis, I think a sort of spiritual crisis in this country. I mean, there's a lot of things that could go wrong, and they could all go wrong at the same time. But that doesn't mean we won't survive it. But it's going to hurt. Great. <laughs> but we're survivors. We are survivors. And you know what? The, everyone, that, just about everyone I know that's been through a crisis has told me that that crisis was the best thing that happened to them in their life. That's both personally and countries like Bosnia, Sarajevo. Like the, uh, the people I know in Sarajevo, the war was a horror show, should never have happened. But people later said to me, you know what? We really suffered then, but it made us better people. Like we are who we are now because of that suffering. And so that, that kind of crisis um, can have an incredibly powerful effect on, on the human psyche and a pretty good one. Sebastian, it's been great talking to you. You too. If shit goes down in my marriage, <laughs> I'm coming to you All right. as the most out-of-the-box, best marriage counselor um, money could buy. I'll put a shovel in your hand and say, start digging. We need some ditches, Doug. <laughs> I love it. If you like listening to this podcast, you're going to like watching it even more. So go check out Klepper. It's on all of your devices, including your television. Go check it out. Thank you for listening. <laughs>